Yes, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I'm probably one of the few that are local. So we are in Google around the corner in Venice uh, by the beach. So which is a very bad excuse to, to be late today. <laughs> but here I am. So thanks for the invitation. Um, so obviously, what we do at the team in Google is very related to quantum computing. So I'm going to give a very practical talk on two applications. There are many two applications that we can, where we can use tensor networks uh, to help us with with quantum computing experiments and, and developments. So this is obviously work not done in isolation. So there's a lot of people to thank. Um, hopefully, at the end, I don't forget anyone. But but yeah, this is I'm talking here, but this is work I've done with a lot of collaborators. So let me give you an outline of, of the talk, just broad picture. So let me motivate why tensor networks might be a good idea to use in several areas of, of quantum computing and experimental quantum computing. Um, the, from the two use cases I'm going to describe, the first one is going to have more to do with NISC experiments. So you know, unprotected, error unprotected experiments where we try to compute something either of views or, or, or trying to show some demonstration of classical hardness with our quantum machines. And the second one is going to be a, of a different flavor. That's how, how to use tensor networks to, to decode early demonstrations of error correction. All right, so let me get to the motivation. So let me talk first about the status quo of current um, experiments. So different companies, universities, labs, etc., have now platforms that are fairly big, still far from from ideal, but fairly big. Uh, and they can carry out, we can think of carrying out experiments that have some use or some physical motivation to them. So there has been many examples in the, la in the recent years. Another flavor of experiments that some groups are interested in are, have to do with showing beyond classical capabilities. So experiments that are natural to perform on the device, maybe without any error mitigation or definitely not correction. And they try to be hard for a classical competitor. So this is more on the, we're not trying to find any useful application here, but just to show that in principle, we're in a regime that we call beyond classical. Can, can you yes? say a little, a, a little slower and explain sort of more what this first bunch is and what, what's been done and say with the second? Sure, sure. So this is a bunch okay, of examples. Day to day, very few talks, so take your time. and. OK, OK. Get us all on Sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure of what the audience would be. So I'm um, completely ignorant. OK, awesome. So yeah, many of these works are not from our team, so or not, or not my own, so I'm not going to describe them in, in detail. But for example, um, one interesting uh, application of quantum computers, for example, that is now getting unlocked, becoming available, is speeding up um, or trying to see how we speed up MERA. So MERA is a, is a very interesting tensor network that people use in classical uh, simulation of quantum systems. And it turns out that several tensor network methods, you could think of speeding up and getting higher precision, et cetera, the day you have a good, reliable quantum computer. So there's already explorations, for example, in that realm. And so they claim that they can do this, or the, the, the well, you can do this. Have a plan to do this. Right. So you can currently do this for very small systems. So you don't gain anything compared to what you can do, say, in your laptop. But it is already starting to, to explore these kind of applications. And what about the graph problems there? <coughs> graph problems. So there is some work on solving some sort of graph problems with optical systems. So that's far from what we do. But for example, in USDC, they have a very strong team on quantum optics. And and both like, on sampling. What kind yes. of graph problems are, are, are being solved? To be honest, putatively being solved. I see. I see. So I am not an expert in in each of these um, in, in, in each of these applications. So I'm not going to get into them. I just wanted to motivate the 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 talk. Um, I've worked more on on this third bullet point. Which is okay. information scrambling so in quantum systems. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, with with the current systems that we have, you can explore uh, how information is propagated on a quantum system when you evolve in time. A very simple model for that is a random circuit. 
And you can in particular study how OTOX, which stands for out of order time correlator, um, out, of um, out of time order correlators, um, which has some precise mathematical definition. And it tells you how a perturbation on so some area of your system is affecting a different area or a different qubit in our platforms uh, after a certain time, after several cycles of evolution. Um, so there, you can, you can measure signals already that are pretty hard to simulate classically. So they are kind of reaching a beyond classical regime. Um, and the interesting thing is that there is some physical motivation there. So, so this has to do with studying uh, systems that show uh, chaos in their evolution. Um, other kind of experiments, like, um, well, you can realize topological phases of matter on a quantum, quantum device that is not aiming at any beyond classical capability, that is just aiming at actually implementing on an experimental setup uh, something that has been developed just theoretically. Um, other applications uh, that are, as I said, not useful and not trying to find any use are the directly beyond classical demonstrations, beyond classical attempts, uh, which try to show um, results that are really hard to get uh, by classical means, but that on a quantum computer or other platforms that use quantum physics to, to process information, they, they might be easy to, to show. So one particular example we've worked a lot on is random circuit sampling. And I, I will get in more detail in, uh, later in the talk. That was the problem precisely. Well, I will, yes, okay. yes, yes. And a third kind of uh, flavor in these uh, early experiments is actually very practical in the sense that it, it is attempting to, to improve the kind of platforms that we have in order to, to find, um, to, to get to quantum error-corrected uh, computers. So today, as of today, there has already been a few demonstrations of quantum error correction and a, a demonstration of error suppression, which is what you want in order to scale up uh, quantum error correction on your device. So, um, so there are several examples. I will talk more about uh, our work from, from, from a couple of years ago, published last year. So the first kind of two, two sets of problems uh, we call NISC. So they don't attempt to correct errors. There might be some error mitigation, but uh, we are kind of trying to perform a computation with pretty unprotected uh, errors. So what does NISC stand for? NISC stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Devices. Okay. I can guess, so, guess the cube for sure. <laughs> so noisy, so that emphasizes the fact that we are not in an error corrector regime, but we already have some large or large enough size or intermediate scale quantum devices where we can attempt to perform some interesting computations. And QEC, um, well, that one is easier, is quantum error correction. And, and there we, we are actually trying as a, as a community to, to, to improve the platforms, improve uh, the understanding of errors, and actually get to logical qubits. OK, so in, on these two realms, on the NIST realm, uh, the way tensor networks enter is the following. So in this case, uh, we have experiments. One example, the one I talked about, a little bit OTOX um, gives you some circuits where you are measuring some observable and they have kind of this, this form. This is just for illustration. There's not many details I'm going to go into. All the kinds of examples like random circuit sampling. Uh, you have a different ensemble of circuits. And in this case, you are sampling. You're not computing uh, any observable or estimating any observable. But in any case, any of these two computations, you can attempt them with tensor networks classically, with tensor network contraction. Um, some path that physicists are more used to is exploiting the structure of the system and say exploiting compressibility or in more physical terms, low entanglement. You can exploit more um, the, the, the topology of your correlations, et cetera, in order to try to get an efficient simulation of your system. Um, in the worst case, which is what some of these experiments are trying to target, 
you cannot do much better than brute force. You can still map this to a tensor over contraction, and we will, and I'll explain that in detail, but you cannot play too much with the structure in order to gain uh, speed ups. On the other side of the spectrum, these QVC experiments, and this is just some, some cartoon for illustration, but this comes from, from our recent experiment. Um, what you need to do is to find out or to try to figure out what errors occur on your system and try to correct them. In order to do that, there is, you can have an understanding of what underlying error model you have in your system. I will talk about these kind of graphs in the second half of the presentation. And what you can do with tensor networks is the following. So given an error model and given some measurements you perform in the system, I'll get into, you can try to decode. So that is figure out what happened to your logical observables. Did they get corrupted or not? And if they did, how can you correct them? And so there is a mapping from this problem to a tensor network uh, problem. And second, uh, in practice, you can actually contract this efficiently in practical cases and try to decode uh, your experiment. So let's get into the first half of the talk, which is talking about how tensor networks might enter one of the ways tensor networks enter uh, benchmarking NISC experiments. So these noisy experiments. Um, I'll explain where the simulation comes in and why tensor networks are a good tool for simulation. Then how we try to tame these brute force approaches in order to make them more approachable. Then I'll give some results as examples, but I'll, I will focus on the, on the methods. And then I'll, I'll end with something unrelated to tensor networks, or not directly related to tensor, tensor networks, but some interesting open question on these experiments. So, okay, so as I described earlier, we start with an experiment in our lab, and we're trying to attempt some computation. And sometimes this computation is trying to be really hard to mock classically. So in this case, this is a cartoon of a circuit taken from a random circuit sampling experiment. And, but in any other, in other experiments, we might wanna do different things. Maybe not only sampling, maybe we wanna estimate an observable. Or maybe we wanna try to sample uh, for which classically we will have to compute probability amplitudes, etc. So it looks pretty natural to try to use tensor networks to understand these circuits and to perform computations about them that give us some classical um, answer to the problem we're trying to solve. And um, these kind of uh, classical tools might be very useful for characterization. We might want to check that the experiment is doing the right thing, so kind of estimate its fidelity, check that the observables we're computing through the experiment are correct, um, check before you run the experiment what kind of results you expect, etc. Another way tensor networks might be useful here is to actually challenge beyond, beyond classical claims. So if we run really large experiments that are supposed to be really hard classically, well then we might well try really hard classically to debunk that challenge to debunk that claim. And one way we can do that is with very highly optimized tensor network contractions. So these highly optimized uh, methods might give you an insight on what is the classical computational cost if you believe these methods are actually the best you can do. Uh, they give you some guarantees on hardness, some limited guarantees in practice, nothing rigorous. Um, it's just uh, practical insights based on numerics. And it might give you insight also on whether you have entered something that we might think of as a beyond classical regime. So it seems like simulation is pretty important for the development, development of experiments and benchmarking experiments. And so we will dive into how we perform simulations in not in the most generic case, but in, in some regime of experiments. So there's several simulation tools several simulation techniques that apply for special cases. The Clifford circuits, they are efficient when they apply. Uh, Clifford plus T, they try to tame some, some more brute force approach, Mat match gate circuits. Um, in physics, when you have localization, you might find uh, easier dynamics to simulate. Or when you have too much noise in your system, that might hinder the entanglement formation and so on. I'm not getting into detail in, in all of this, but there's, I just want, the audience to know 
that there is several special cases where other techniques apply. Now, in the generic worst case, you cannot do much better than the mapping I mentioned earlier. So you have a circuit from which you get samples and you try to compute something from these samples and you cannot do much better than mapping this circuit onto a tensor network, which I'll get into this mapping in a second. And from this tensor network, contract it for different uh, small variations of the tensor network and compute different quantities, some observables, or the amplitudes that we use to sample, etc. So tensor networks are a good primitive for both computing quantities that we're interested in, or also as primitives of tasks we're interested in. So, by the way, feel free to ask any question uh, during the presentation. Um, it's probably better to interrupt than to, than to ask all the questions at the end. So, okay, so random circuit sampling is gonna be our case study and has been kind of the bait for, for many people. One of, them, one of the main contributors is Johnny Gray, who's in the audience to develop these tensor over methods for very large uh, simulations of quantum circuits. So what is the task of random circuit sampling? In this task was designed to not give, I mean, it was not designed with uh, usefulness in mind, it was designed with hardness, classical hardness in mind. So okay, random circuit sampling is something a quantum computer can do. So what do you do? You specify some random circuit over your device you run it. Mm -hmm. So are these classical gates or quantum gates? Quantum, this is a quantum circuit. It's a quantum circuit. Mm -hmm. And you have some gate set that you're choosing from. Right, you have some hardware gate set yes. that you can choose from physically. And you have some connectivity constraints in practice on you know, what qubits can have a two qubit gate with who else. Um, and then you try to randomize the gates within your set as much as possible. So just like here it looks like, and if, if the, I don't know how accurate this picture mm -hmm. is. This is just a cartoon in one dimension. So we have a one dimensional array of qubits and time flows to the right. And, and so you only have pairwise, you only have nearest neighbor interactions. Right. And only two at a time. Correct. So, you're so trying to describe what the rules are. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the gate is, um, Constraining yourself to two qubit gates is pretty typical experimentally. Yeah. I just want to know what, you're, mm -hmm. yeah, what the constraints are. Fair enough, yeah. And, and also, it looks like you're, you're having each, at each moment, you're having a lot of interactions. Yes, at a, yes. At a sparse. So that's. Is that built into the model or is that just the picture? A, no, this is actually experimentally achievable. You, you can have several two qubit gates applied at once in parallel. But, the, but at, at any given moment, it looks like almost everyone is, is involved in, in a gate. Correct. All right. And, yeah. And yes, and that's, and that's very similar that's to, the, to reality, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And well, you have two, two parameters here, right? Like the number of qubits and, uh, and the depth of the circuit, or for how long it's running. And, and how many distinct gates are we talking about? Uh, in practice, the... Um, there is one qubit gate. So if, if you look at experiments that have actually been, been performed, um, the randomization comes from one qubit gates in between these two qubit gates. And two qubit gates are fixed. No, but I'm asking, what's the library of gates that you're allowed? Oh, I see, I see, I see. How many, how many diff distinct gates can appear? Um, as far as I know, for, there have been four experiments, four papers describing experiments. Uh, of this uh, for random circuit sampling, and all of them focus on a, on a gate that is really close to, uh, to an ISO. Some... I think the question is more like, what is the depth of the circuit? Right? How many gates are in total in the circuit? Oh, yes. I see. Uh, that... I think it was uh, which elementary gates you can use. Yes, that was the first question. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, um... Do you have a list of two, four? I mean, it changes the problem. One. One. What? One. One. They are slightly different, they, they are calibrated so that they achieve highest fidelity on each qubit. So they might change the parameters slightly, but they, are, they all live in the, a very similar point in the, in the same manifold. Yeah. We have a parameterized gate with two parameters, and the highest fidelity is always achieved around the same similar values of those two parameters for all qubits at all times. It is universal with the one qubit gate, when you throw the one qubit gate in, yes. 
We are using a universal thing. Entirely accurate, right? There's two qubit gates and they are fixed in the experiment, but there's also one qubit gate in between, and those can be randomly chosen for from a certain set. Okay. And now, what is this? Since you just have a single two qubit gate, what is it? What, like the matrix form? Maybe, maybe it's yeah. Easy to write it down. Oh, sure. Might forget some. Don't underestimate my ignorance. <laughs> no, 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 I apologize for for. <laughs> I got surprised when the previous talk was was more lecture style, and and yeah, I have more of a results oriented talk, so I'm, I apologize for that. But no, you need to apologize to show me. Yes, yes. <laughs> I will take action. Okay, so the gate we have, we call it FSIM. It's a parameterized gate. Depends on two parameters, and it has the following form. So might be forgetting some i somewhere, but it's something like this. Okay. And, zero, and zero, zero. Data in yeah. C are, are allowed are chosen randomly or are they they actually calibrated to um, they, they are not chosen randomly. The randomness does not come from, from theta and phi. Okay. Theta and phi, in the experiments, they're close to, 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 I believe, these other values. Okay. So the randomness is just yeah. purely coming from the... One cubic gate. Okay. So the idea that this is the, the gate that, makes, that creates entanglement. Correct. Okay. Correct. Between the two qubits. Yeah. Can you say it a little louder? That is a gate that creates entanglement between the qubits, yes. the two qubits, then you use one qubit gate so to generate for the rest. I see. Is that right, without this gate, you have just a product state involved, you know, each qubit independently, but there is a very dense... In, in that sense, the picture is not very accurate. You have a single layer, one layer of two qubit gates, and then in between a layer of one qubit. And only the one qubit gates are Correct. chosen according to some distribution. Okay. Correct. I was trying to see. I think I got Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so once we have a random circuit sample from this ensemble of random circuits, which is in practice very particular, um, we sample, we run the experiment once, we measure in the computational basis, and we get some bit string out. And then we repeat this process many, many times, and we get several bit strings out. In reality, of the order of a million or a couple million. And what do we use these bit strings for? Well, we want to estimate the fidelity from samples, which is something we know how to do. It's something I will not get into, but it's through a technique called cross entropy benchmarking. So, from, from these samples, you can estimate fidelity. And the goal of the experiment is to sample with enough closeness, let's, let's put it that way, to the ideal distribution here. So in reality, we have errors in, as, the, as the experiment goes on. And so these bit strings are really sampled not from the ideal output distribution, but from some other noisy distribution. But we want to show that we, have, we are not too far, or that we can measure some signal of the ideal distribution. So how do we do this? We estimate the fidelity of this quantum state. And, and we want to show that this fidelity is larger than zero with statistical distance. And so the competitor, the classical competitor, can it perform this task? And of course, it can perform this task if you have infinite resources. But can it do it in a reasonable amount of time with actual existing computational resources? And there is fairly strong complexity uh, guarantees, but not completely uh, robust. There's a bunch of papers on, on results on that on the realm that show the hardness of this task, classically. And they show also that you can not do much better than the method I will, I will show, which is brute force contraction of tensor networks. So it seems like this is a good use case for optimizing um, how we use tensor networks, which is going to be our primitive for classical adversary techniques. And how do we mock the same kind of task with a classical uh, method, with a tensor network in particular? Well, there is an algorithm developed not for tensor networks in particular, but more generic to sample um, bit strings from the output of the circuit uh, classically. It was introduced in 2018. 
and it is some twist over rejection sampling. So how does rejection sampling work? Well, you have some distribution you want to sample from. You have another distribution that you have access to that you can sample from. And by generating samples from the first one, if you can compute probabilities of the second one, then you can accept or reject bit strings with some rule um, to actually sample from the target distribution. So this is very similar to what is done here. So we compute probabilities of the ideal uh, distribution in the output, this px, where x is a bit string in the output. And we accept, sorry, we, we sample x from uniformly at random, but you compute the probability from the ideal distribution. And then you accept x as a valid sample of p of x if um, with probability proportional to, to px um, times this factor, which is n, the number of, of, of this is unfortunate, this n means the, the dimensional Hiller space, and m is some factor that you can work out the math, and it turns out to be the acceptance ratio. So by tuning this m, uh, you can get a better acceptance ratio at the expense of some bad approximation, and it turns out that we get a really good approximation, much lower than the... Uh, what, yeah. what's it? <laughs> I, I, I don't quite understand what the, what the challenge is here. Okay. Some random circuit sampling, but it's not some completely random list otherwise. Uh, uh, and then you're, you're trying to imitate that. Is that what's going on? Yes, we're trying to imitate that task so classically. There's a yeah. controlled randomness going on. Mm -hmm. What's enabling you to achieve this controlled randomness on the bottom? What is new compared to? So, so, you're, so the top is, is is not completely random. It's some. I mean, there's no random. That's happening. Right? You have one specific realization drawn from that random ensemble of, of tensor networks, right? So this will have one specific output distribution, with zero randomness. So are you trying to guess the distribution of samples? You're trying to sample from the distribution. You have a specification of the distribution I see. as a, as a <laughs> quantum circuit. So, so mm -hmm. the distribution is handed to you. And you can as in the form of a quantum system. circuit, yes. An efficient way to sample it. Correct, yeah. You will not get an efficient way, but you want our way to sample it, yes. It's kind of tricky because the output is almost flat, right? Because you have a quite deep circuit with fairly random elements, but it's not completely flat. There's some fluctuations, so you're trying to, to get these fluctuations. Right? So how does a sampling algorithm work, by the way? I mean, is, is the intuition that it's correct? If, if, if I compute this P of X and M is actually two to the number of bits, yes. or whatever, then it's actually correct because I'm just computing probabilities and I'm only yeah, computing yeah, things. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Now, so most of the time it fails, and, and that's not what you want, but you say you approximate by accepting, accepting a bit too general species. Yeah, so the, the problem that you have, rejection sampling, um, you know, common rejection sampling uh, deals with two probability distributions, the target one and your proxy one. And the proxy one, you multiply by a factor so that it, it is an envelope of the target one. For this kind of distribution, you can never, there's always a tail of the distribution that goes out of the, of the envelope. Yeah, so, you, so you're always making a small approximation if you try to play this game. Yeah, but, but one way to think of it, you had to just pick a, a number of bit strings, mm -hmm. right, which is fairly small, and I say, well, exactly output those, but the probability should match the correct probability. Yes. one limit of it, right? That, yes, that's, that's the target. Just ignore everything else, I just try to get the probability inside that. Correct, correct, correct. correct. So most of the times you reject your candidate bit string, and sometimes you accept. Okay. Yes, and in order to do that, you have to compute these probabilities, which involve, and I'll get into that, uh, contracting uh, a very large tensor network. Um, is that very smart or not very smart? I decided that that's a smart way of doing it, or very stupid. You don't have to decide now. <laughs> okay, good. Um, but yes, I want, and, the, and the goal of this is to, is to get a similar output, to get a bunch of bit strings that we are sampling classically from the specification of a probability distribution given in the form of a quantum circuit. Um, and to do it in order to challenge the claim that we are performing something that is beyond classical. Okay, so how do we compute these probability, probability amplitudes for a particular bit string? Well, we can trivially write um, a quantum circuit as a tensor network. A quantum circuit is 
uh, subset. Quantum circuits are a subset of tensor networks. They, they, um, they constrain every gate to be unitary in the time direction. Um, initializing qubits, each qubit that you initialize uh, on, if you have a product state of qubits, you can initialize it with tensors that are completely disconnected from each other. And then if you want to compute the probability amplitude of a particular bit string, then you can also write out the output of your circuit projectors onto the, onto the specific outcome you're expecting. And contracting that object, where each gate here or each initialization or each projector is a tensor with as many indices as legs. And contracting that means executing this very large sum over all indices or all legs. Um, and that's going to give you the probability. If you are able to perform that computation, that's going to give you the probability amplitude of the bit string. So OK, let's try to do that. The problem is that that is usually a very hard task to perform. And we know from more than a decade ago that the order of contraction or the order in which you perform these sums affects a lot the computational cost. Okay, it has to do with some graph property of the tensor network. And so it looks like our goal is to optimize how we are performing this tensor network contraction. Um, and we want to find uh, the best instance of this object, the ordering, that gives us the lowest uh, classical cost okay, in terms of additions and multiplications. And as I said, Johnny, Johnny Gray worked a lot on this a few years ago, and we built upon that progress. So, um, all right, what happens with the... Uh, yes? What are the techniques used to, to choose to optimize the order? Yes, let me get to that in the next slide. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, what happens to the memory? If you have a really good contraction ordering that minimizes the number of flops that you have, um, can you actually perform this? What is the memory complexity? Well, it turns out that for practical cases, yes? So do you want to contract exactly, or are you willing to accept, accept some errors in the contraction? In principle, exactly. We're, we're going to try to introduce errors later. In principle, exactly. Yes. And you might want to do something like entanglement truncation as you evolve. That's, a, in general, not a good idea for the circuits, since they, they build entanglement uh, as fast. But you, as but you have a problem here, yes. no? because, because the contraction of an arbitrary 2D tensor network like this one yeah. is empty hard. Right. Okay. Yes. So uh, how do you cope with that? Right. We we try to, and you're not gonna we're not gonna find an efficient. I mean, method. unless you do some truncation. Right. So I'll, I'll I'll show I'll show you. And that is the point of random circuit sampling, right? Like you're trying to 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 find a problem that is hard to to do classically. OK, so in practice, for the circuits that, that we run in experiments, the memory requirements that you find with these very optimized contraction orderings and the largest the access to the largest memory possible that you have on, on this planet, on the largest supercomputer, they are off by a, about a factor of 10 to the 4. So they, they exceed the, the actual realistic assumption by a factor of 4. So you cannot fit this in memory. So how do you do it? Well. There is a solution that came up a few years ago from the Alibaba group, and which today, uh, to date is still, as far as I know, the best solution to this problem for these particular um, simulations, is the following. So what happens if you project, you take an index, say let's choose index A here, and we project it. In our case, all of these indices are binary. All these variables are binary. So you can project it to 0, and you can project it to 1. and then you contract either the tensor network where you projected it to 0 or the equivalent where you predicted A to 1. Okay, that looks like really getting rid of this index since that degree of freedom is gone. And so what you expect if you choose this index well is to have a contraction that is much easier to perform if you are good at choosing these indices and there's no guarantee on finding one. Um, that is easier to compute in terms of um, computational cost but also in terms of memory, so you can, if you do this a few times for several well-chosen indices, you can fit the now exponentially many computations um, What's on a realistic it's computer. What's significant decrease in memory cost? Uh, empirical, just empirical. And what yes. is that? What's that? Well, you, you have to what, what it's makes something? Is determining what is well-chosen 
kind of uh, by experiment, or there is some theory guiding you to your choices? Um, there is oh, numerics guiding you through guess, through this optimization. I guess the closer to you get to a tree tensor network, the better. So, so uh, right, yeah. right, so of course. Yeah. Typically, it must be a different story. I mean, there's a counting story. Right? Mm -hmm. and then certainly, counting will decrease the rank in whatever partition, which means the actual split rank. Right. This is not empirical. This is something one can just check. Yes. Right? Or if you do an approximate contraction, it might not mm -hmm. decrease that rank very much. Right. But once you truncate, it might go down. And that's probably more empirical. But I think that it seems like these are two completely different ways in which this can lead to improvements. Sure. We're not going to do any truncation. But I don't see why this should kind of significantly decrease the, the tree width of the graph if you cut in a few places. Maybe why should it? OK, so in the. Um, Maybe that's not what it happens. So, I have some intuition and, and definitely numerical results on what happens asymptotically when you increase the volume of your tensor network. And I am talking about volume because you know this lives in, in this cartoon in two dimensions or, or in reality in three dimensions. We have a two-dimensional layout of qubits with nearest neighbor interactions. So nearest neighbor to qubit gates, and then a third dimension for time. But that's when you initially truncate at some point, or? No. You're doing exact contractions. Yes. That, and there, should, exact, there should be a way to understand why this helps, right? Because the graph, also the Google experiments have extremely regular, right? Right, it's right. It's not like a random type of graph yeah. where it's kind of hard to argue why they are, in a few places makes it much simpler. But they are finite size. So asymptotically, you do require, as your intuition might expect, um, uh, an extensive number of, of these projections, we, we call slicing, just for, for graphical um, reasons. Um, you need an extensive number of slices in order to, to bring the tensor network to within a memory constraint. Okay, so if you increase your, your system size by two, you need twice the number of slices. That's no now, good intuition. Finite, that's, that's no good intuition why it helps. If it helps, I should at least be an intuitive way to see how it kind of sets. Yeah, so one, the one not optimal, but good, good for visualization way to choose these slices is to take your volume of the tensor network and really cut it in, in, in sub-cubes, mm -hmm. right? And every index that goes through your, your knife, knife goes through many indices, you just project all of them, okay? in all directions. The way I see it is that you are cutting the spreading of entanglement up to a final size. Right. Okay. Yeah, but, so but you're of course that... smaller blocks, so then it's up to you to prove that that gives you yeah. the result. It's a bit tricky, no? Because then ideally I should just write the whole sum explicitly, then I never have to contract any tensors. Yeah, but that's, that's equivalent to, to projecting all indices, to slicing all right. indices. So uh, I think the intuition needs a bit more than just to say I make smaller cubes, right? Because obviously there must be a small well, spot. That is one way to do it, right? right. In, asymptotically, that's actually close to the, the best you can do. Okay. I mean, I'm just trying to get some understanding why. Yes. Maybe that's not possible. And it's supported by numerics, but that's asymptotically. For, for finite sizes, you do find better, better results empirically than, than that. Maybe I can say for this like square, one way to think about what happens is you could choose the indices as like cutting half of the top into a U. And then now the contraction, rather than going from left to right, goes round in this like U shape with obviously half the tree width. And those tend to be good indices because they're carried throughout the entire contraction, which means that there's no, um, what, what's called like overhead to slicing. So there's like some number of indices that you can slice without incurring any exponential overhead. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, so, so what do I achieve with this? Well, it does alleviate the memory requirements. If you cut enough indices, as you said, you can even just boil this down to not having any contraction, just summing over all, in, all configurations over all indices. That's definitely a, an extreme of, of this technique. And another perk that you get as a byproduct is that each of these independent tensor networks you can contract in different machines. You can parallelize this trivially. Uh, what is bad about this? Well, now you have a whole exponential set of tensor networks that you have to contract for each projection. Of one index, you get two tensor networks. If you project two indices, you have four tensor networks, etc. So this builds up very quickly, and so this can hinder your your time complexity, at the exp you know, just by trying to fit this in a realistic machine's memory. 
So, so let's formalize this optimization problem. So we have a tensor network where we have chosen an ordering that we called big O. And we've chosen for a given um, slice set, which we call S, we have a cost. And this cost can be anything we want. In particular, it's very useful to consider the total number of multiplications and additions that you have to perform in the whole computation, so the number of flops. You might want to use other more realistic contract, um, costs for, say, the time to solution in your machine, counting for uh, not only multiplications and additions, but memory access, for example. Um, and then, so we have this um, cost function, C, of O and S, the ordering and the slices. And we want also to satisfy this constraint. We want to fit the memory, M, of the same variables within some memory constraint. Okay, to be pedantic, we're not doing exactly that. We are choosing slices the following way. We have a pool or an order set of candidates to be sliced, of candidate indices. And we take as many in that order as we need in order to satisfy the constraint. This is something you can always do. And so now, instead of really having as an independent variable the set of slices, we have as an independent variable the ordering in which we pull uh, slices from the candidate list. And so, really to be pedantic, we have uh, a cost function over the ordering and that order set of slices, of candidate slices. Okay? And that's what we are trying to, that's what we are trying to optimize, right? This, we're trying to achieve the lowest possible cost in the cost function, given this constraint. And the memory has to be lower than some, some, some constraint value. And so how do we do this in practice? Well, there is different heuristics. Definitely, definitely Johnny has explored a lot of those. The one we found to be performing very well are your typical um, all-purpose uh, optimization techniques like simulated annealing or pallet tempering, okay, where you have some move in the space of these two variables, and you keep moving and comparing to what, what your result is compared to the previous one, and accept or reject, et cetera, and keep walking down downhill to, to find some good solution. And for this ensemble of, of, of tensor networks, this works very well, very fast, and it gives very, well, compared to, to other results and compared to our target uh, computational resources, it gives fairly good results. So on top of this, there's a plethora of tricks that people have introduced. The, the optimal pattern of, of cuts you get, does it look kind of random spread out or how does it uh, it looks pretty evenly spread in, in space, at least when you start having so you're not very not large. Doing the same, but what Johnny said, you're not cutting it along one specific line, it's pretty much a random cut and it happens to be very good. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's, it's not random, it's just well, trying uh, to uh, optimize this, but yeah. It's not that you look at it and you say, ah, that's why it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yes. yes, right. Okay, so just computing C given O and S, is it efficient? Right, so C of, I'll talk more about that. But actually, in like 30 seconds, so, so I'll answer, yes. Um, okay, so there's a lot of tricks that people have developed for, you know, given a contraction ordering, given a set of slices, how we can further uh, reduce the cost of this kind of brute force, optimized but still brute force approach. And there is a few that are worth mentioning, but there is more. So, so the, the output, as it, as you know, we want many probability amplitudes to see the output of this, so that we can accept or reject many bit strings. And so do we want to, for a million amplitudes or 10 million amplitudes, do we want to compute this 10 million times? Well, it turns out, and, and uh, Feng Pan will also give a talk, probably on a different talk, topic this week. Uh, he and collaborators introduced this. You can, with a single contraction, uh, compute an entire set of output amplitudes that are actually not even correlated. You can choose them beforehand, and then your output uh, tensor, when you imagine you contract this entire tensor network, you end up with a tensor. It is sparse on the output index, and it, it has been projected to only the subspace you cared about, to only the, the bit strings you previously uh, chose. Okay? I'm not gonna explain how to do that uh, in software, but that is definitely something you can do. And so, what is the benefits of that? Well, your Time to solution for computing n amplitudes, let's say n is 10 million, is not n times 
the time to solution of computing a single one is much, much lower. It's, you only get impacted by a small factor. Um, well, there is, as we discussed earlier, very, very specific uh, sets of gates that we are using in hardware. And maybe they have some structure that we can exploit. They're not completely hard random gates. And so in particular, this FSIM gate, this FSIM gate from the blackboard, has a very interesting structure. It has a lot of zeros, it's pretty sparse, and it does actually look, you can decompose it as a classical swap uh, followed by a diagonal gate. Okay, so that's something we mentioned in the original Beyond Classical paper. We didn't know how to, exp how to exploit it well, and then again, Feng um, came up with a way to, to do this well. Okay, so, and, and what do you gain here? Well, it turns out that when you slice an index around this gate, an index that touches this gate, you are actually, with a very, very small error, already de facto slicing a different one. Okay, so you can ignore a second index. Um, you can project a second index and, and not lose much of the weight uh, of, your, of, your, of your tensor, of the gate tensor. Okay, so the, 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 the gate uh, lives in a subspace that is very small, and by projecting one index, you're actually projecting also a different one. Was, yeah? was that something very specific to the like, original RCS gate sets? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it might be specific to other gates, but it, it definitely I mean, applies it, here. Yeah, is it something that would be easy, is easy to fix in a new set? Uh, well, don't tell that to the experimentalists, but <laughs> yeah. In, in theory, it is very easy to, to fix. In practice, yeah, it's not that easy to, to have good gates of, of arbitrary shape, yes. Um, another trick that is very useful is memoization. So, so all of these independent tensor networks that we're contracting, parallelizing trivially over different um, computations, they actually have a lot of computation in common. They, they share a lot of common intermediate tensors. And so it might be a good idea to cache those to use dynamic programming to once you've computed it, uh, all the other branches of your computation should be able to use them for free. Okay, so you save a lot of, a lot of time there. And as someone asked earlier, we are targeting exact simulations, but not really, almost exact. It turns out that with the, the experimental fidelity is very small. And it turns out that you can get some small, very modest uh, speed up factor by targeting low fidelity. And, and yeah, that was explored a few years ago, and we still use that technique. Um, the, the answer to this in high level um, goes the following way. So you have an exponential number of tensor networks that you want to contract, each one for an instance of your sliced indices. And you might want to contract all exponentially many of them. But it turns out that if you contract only a fraction of them, a fraction f of them, you see in the output a wave function that it has actually fidelity f compared to the, to the ideal one. And this is what you expect from a, from a very randomized circuit. And this we see numerically also. So you can get some modest speed up there. Okay, so all of these, uh, it's called tricks, are accounted for in the, in the cost function. Well, like you, you develop some, some model of your cost. Maybe your cost is flops, but flops after you've taken all of these uh, tricks into account, where flops means floating point operations, so multiplications and additions, uh, to give an example. Um, and as, as, as someone asked earlier also, uh, the, the, um, the key to have a very good optimizer here is to have a very fast, in practice, very fast evaluation of the cost function. Okay, so we do spend a lot of effort optimizing this thing, so it is very fast to, to evaluate. And you know, if you want to run a Simulate an annealing with millions of steps, you don't get killed by, by evaluating this over and over again. Uh, to give an example of, of system size, current experiments have about, uh, they're getting to around the hundreds, they're getting to 1,000 to giving it. So that's kind of the size of the tensor network you're working with. How many qubits? Up uh, to 70. 70. Uh, all right, so some example results. I focus on the methods, but we do have some results that are interesting. Uh, per se, but also to show how, you know, what kind of things you can do with this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing uh, the random circuit sampling and beyond classical nature of all of this, but just to give you an, an example of what you can do. Where does mm -hmm. 
1 times 10 to the 13th year. All right, so <laughs> let me go there. <laughs> so, okay, as I said, these experiments are trying to achieve beyond classical uh, computations. And so in 2019, we ran an experiment over 53 qubits, and USTC in China had uh, subsequent experiments over 56, 60 qubits, and, and they started uh, getting larger depths. Last year, we ran an experiment over 70 qubits with also much larger depth, and one over 67 qubits with much, much larger depth. And so the, the goal here is to benchmark, okay, how hard would these, the like quantum computer is already doing this, with, if you look at the fidelities, estimated fidelities here, they're really small, but they are statistically uh, speaking above zero. So they, they measure some signal of the actual output state. Um, and the idea is that these computations, these sampling computations, are really hard classically, really hard to mock classically. So, so we, can, we can run this optimizer and get different kinds of results. One thing you want, might want to try first um, is to try to optimize without memory constraints. Let's see what happens to the optimal. If we had access to infinite memory in a, on a classical computer, what would happen to the time to solution? How many multiplications and additions would we would have to perform? So it turns out that, uh, well, that number has been steadily increasing over the years, over the last four years, five years. And we are now on a regime where we are well above what a classical computer can, can do in reasonable times. So, for example, the largest computer on, um, in the world, uh, Frontier, has, if I remember correctly, of the order of 10 to the 18 flops per second. If you run it with no problems at all, like peak performance. Okay, so this is already several orders of magnitude of what that computer can do in a second. Now, we do have memory constraints, and we do have um, so, noisy, yes? So, so what is leading what? That's, I, I, I'm getting confused. Mm -hmm. the, um, the quantum computer has run its ex these experiments. All of these tasks are done by the quantum computer. So these oh, tasks are by quantum computer. Yes. But the fidelity is very low, so you're, you're, you're tolerating your, your task is designed so that you tolerate these kind of fidelities, yes. It's kind of a strange thing to say. It is what it is. It, it is um, a sampling task where the goal is to measure a fidelity that is within several sigmas above zero. And the fidelity of the quantum computer is estimated, or how do you know? It is estimated. In the large regimes, it is estimated. Because to estimate it, you have to compute exact probability amplitudes, and you cannot by, by design. So um, it is computed exactly for smaller systems. And for larger systems, there are similar circuits, but with, you know, with less entanglement or with, with no gates between two halves of the system. So, so you can simulate both systems separately. Or, so there is different circuits adjacent to the, to the one monolithic circuit that, you, that is the, the gold standard, the one that you cannot simulate, where we check the fidelity, also by, with classical means. And, and they all agree very closely, and so, and so when you compute the average, um, you estimate this kind of fidelity. And in the case of, of the 53 qubit experiment, which happened five years ago, these fide the classical methods have improved so much that what originally was beyond classical, now you can actually um, tackle classically with, with very reasonable uh, means. So this fidelity, which was estimated originally, has been confirmed with actual full-scale simulations. And you know, the idea is that through the years, more and more fidelities are confirmed, if people are still interested in, in this. Um, all right, so in reality, as I said, we, we do have memory constraints, and so we might want to focus on estimates that are realistic, that uh, try to fit your computation with the memory constraints, and then try to look at, okay, actually, okay, it is very idealistic to think that your computer will work at peak performance, or probably has, has some low performance, um, low percentage of, of, I call of, of performance compared to the peak one. Uh, we want to implement all our tricks, noisy samples, so we can save some time, etc. So taking everything into account, we arrive to these numbers. Okay, so these are numbers 
based on, on, on optimizations, realistic optimizations, and performance uh, percentages measured over the years on, on this kind of computing architecture, on these kind of supercomputers. So the um, 2019 experiment over 53 qubits is now very, very achievable. The USDC ones start to get very out of control, and our recent experiments are really, really beyond what we can think of. So why are there three numbers here? Okay, so what happens when you have access to, so let's, let's get very practical now, very far from, from just theory, and let's look at how a computer, supercomputer looks. So modern supercomputers are a set of tens of thousands of GPUs, each one with its own memory, uh, and each one with a certain capacity to, to, to perform multiplications and additions. Okay, if you split the computation over all of these GPUs, parallelize it over all of them, and try to fit the memory constraint of each of them, then you get these first five numbers. Okay, and that's what people have been doing in practice. When you try to fight all possible adversaries that might challenge this claim, and that might do things that are really tedious or really unrealistic to do with a supercomputer, then you find these other two numbers. So what happens if you try to fit your computation in all of the RAM of the largest supercomputer on, in the planet, which is called Frontier, and run a completely so distributed over all, of, all the GPUs, you're running really big tensor contractions, then you arrive to this second estimate, okay, 10,000 years. And what happens if on top of that you use, so these supercomputers have adjacent to them a very large amount of storage that is intended for long term. There's really slow access, really slow reads and writes. Um, so, but what would happen if you have access to all of this storage, okay, which would be unrealistic. Nobody has tried that and, and really the input and output from memory would kill you. Uh, but if you assume that that is not an issue, then with that very large memory constraint, uh, you are arrived to, to, this, to this number here. Okay, a different kind of result that I prefer much more. Yes. So what is 50 years referred to using all the 30 or you claim that for the, uh, for, for the uh, 17 qubits sink more, you need uh, 50 years to simulate it? And, and what kind of memory constraint for, for that? A GPU memory constraint, so parallelizing over independent GPUs. Okay. So why is that for one amplitude the, the, the type of capacity is similar, but for, for memory constraint it, it seems like your uh, 70 qubits, the flops will be 10 to the 25, but for, for 67 qubits it turns out to be 10 to the uh, 33. Yes, so um, these circuits, I forgot to put the depth here. They they have much, much larger depth than these. So the tensor number is much bigger. It's, if I remember correctly, about 30% bigger, something like that. So even though there's slightly fewer qubits, there's much, much more depth. But without memory constraint, the, 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 the time capacity is... So right, without memory constraints, uh, you can definitely, one possible contraction, you're, you're not bothering to slice an index, you're just contracting indices. One very special um, uh, uh, contraction is, is just time evolution, right? You start with a tensor that is the initial state, and you apply gates one by one, and you go in the time direction. And in that case, the, the dependence with depth is just linear, so, which is pretty much nothing. Uh, but you do have three fewer qubits, so that probably gives you about a factor of eight, two to the three, eight advantage. And that, I think, is pretty consistent with, with, this, uh, with this difference here. It's slightly, slightly easier. Yeah. So the optimizer, you know, is finding, uh, it is actually finding something close to a time evolution, which is very reasonable. All right, so a different set of results that we can get that are much more insightful into the complexity of these experiments is the following. So again, because the memory constraints are very tedious to check, they depend on realistic assumptions, et cetera. Let's just focus on, without, with infinite memory, no memory constraints, what happens to the actual work you have to put into these contractions, into how many flops, okay? And let's look at ensembles of circuits. 
okay, like the ones in the experiments we run, but let's extrapolate that to more qubits, more depth, with similar architectures. And what happens in that case? Well, it's very interesting that we, we find, you know, for a whole grid of points here, which then we interpolate to generate this plot, uh, we find different uh, numbers of flops for each point in this 2D graph. And, and you see two behaviors. In the large depth uh, limit, um, we find that the cost, and this is consistent with, with this contour plot that we have, is exponential in the number of qubits. And that is very related to what we just talked about. In the very large uh, depth limit, with no memory constraints, with no slicing, the cost just depends pretty much, it's only linear, it only depends linearly in the depth, but it depends exponentially in the number of qubits. Okay, so that's consistent with what we find. And then what kind of behavior do you expect at low depth? Well, at, at low depth, I would expect um, a cost that depends on the depth, exponentially on the depth, and one, this is for 2D circuits, one of the lateral dimensions. And, and that is what we see uh, numerically. And that seems to be some crossover region. This we we'll draw by hand, this line here, which is separating both regions. And the cool thing is that all experiments, as far as I know, that people have run on this kind of um, sampling are in the large depth limit. Okay, so you are not gaining much by increasing the depth without memory constraints. With memory constraints, we saw what happens. Then you have to slice a lot and your time to solution gets wild. All right, so let me get some just very quick comment on, on the prospect of these NISC applications or NISC experiments. And as I said, in, in reality, these experiments have noise. And noise, if you want to measure some signal, which already was tiny for these kinds of experiments, it was in the order of 10 to the minus 3, uh, you cannot get much lower than that. You need an exponential number of, of, of samples to measure any signal when you get very low. So um, they are hindered by noise, and there is only so much computational volume that you can handle in experiments. Okay? And volume, roughly speaking, is the amount of two qubit gates in these circuits or in these tensor networks. And so what that volume is limiting, uh, noise is limiting um, quantum computations. But if you have only finite size computations, then you might have a very, very optimized classical method to compute, to, to simulate and to, to mock these tasks. And so uh, what is the current, what is the status quo of these experiments? Well, in non-useful experiments like random circuit sampling, based on what we've seen for the last few years and based strongly on, on these uh, highly optimized classical methods, it seems like they are pretty, it's pretty established that they are beyond classical. There might be some new method that comes from left field that nobody anticipated and, and beats these kind of claims, but so far it looks like it's pretty established. For useful applications, it seems like the volumes that you need to find something useful are much larger. And so experiments don't have access to that because of noise. And so if you constrain yourself to very small volumes, it seems like tensor networks are still, and, and other methods, are still doing well. And so there's still not yet an established beyond classical um, computation. Strongly supported by the, by the optimized tensor network structure. Is that referring to the not yet or the strongly established? Or both. 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 So this is a good, good diagnostic method. So, so the not yet, I understand how the tensor network contraction is, is, is giving you something, but yes. there may be some other thing other than the tensor network Correct. contraction. Yes. You're all, uh, I, okay. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a sanity check. Yes, yeah, yeah, I just mentioned that. There might be other methods. Um, it wouldn't be the first time that happens, but but so far they seem to be the best methods for these finite size simulations of, of, of large experiments. But, but you were trying to contract the tensor network exactly, right? Almost exactly, with some modest exactly. improvement. But, but, but yeah. we were discussing before, I mean, I guess that at some point you may try to, to start introducing approximations. Yeah, and, and people have tried. And so on, and did, did somebody study that? Because yeah, they, that, yeah. that depends a lot on how, how you contract the 2D tensor network. Okay? Yes. So, it does, it does. And for, as you expect, for some cases it works, for some it doesn't. For random circuits, it seems to be a very bad idea because entanglement grows, um, grows uh, the, yeah, but yeah, grows in the worst case. 
And so, but, but I would like to see a combination of you know playing with this thing about cutting links and so on, and then yeah. depending on how you cut, you know, I wonder if there is some approximation that actually uh, works better than others. Okay, so yeah, Johnny actually has a great package that that you can use to try that. Yeah, and that combines good contractions with uh, on the fly uh, approximations, con compression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in random circuits. It, it's usually not a good idea. It's the really worst case, and all of these methods break. And so the best we, not only we, the, the community has found is, is these brute force approaches. For other experiments, say the, the Floquet evolution of, of this easing model that IBM run, yeah, that was a good idea. You see this 2D, you know, 2D tensor networks that mock the, the experimental architecture. And, and having truncation along the way, that seemed to be a good idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I mean, just intuitively, I would not expect sensor networks to simulate random right. things right. well. Mm -hmm. but for the useful ones, I will. So, right. Uh, that is the. Maybe yeah. other things, that, classical ways to simulate random. Um, yes, actually, actually, I agree, they are, and they are welcome, but yes. Actually, yeah, I think another question. There is, there is no progress in making RCS useful? There is some, <laughs> right, so he, help with that. I mean, huh? there, is, there is a proposal to generate random numbers, certified random numbers, okay. right? <laughs> and uh, and it's, uh, you cannot get out of the loop of the classical complexity. So, so the idea is the following, is from Scott Aronson. So you sample bit strings. Right? And, and, and these are your, these are fresh, random bit strings that you're sampling from some distribution. And to certify that nobody is being malicious and handing them to them, to you, uh, generated by other means, uh, you estimate the fidelity of the, from the bit strings you get. Okay, and then if you have guarantees that this, there's no way you can do this with classical means, you have to have a quantum computer to generate them. But, but there is a broken step there, right? Like you need to compute to estimate the fidelity. And for that, you need to compute classically um, probability amplitude. And so the thing that you didn't want in the first place, that is like a classical agent is able to simulate this, well, you're requiring this person. You're requiring someone to compute these probability amplitudes that they could use to sample anyways. And so you can try to, to crunch the numbers and say, OK, you only check every few times. Who knows? That gives only partial guarantees. But still, it seems like there is no window where this works in practice. Yeah. Can I ask you a question just to be uh, um, I mean, there are some results uh, on random circuits in which uh, you know that uh, some large class of observables are actually efficient can be calculated efficiently using a random circuits, and for that class of uh, uh, observables, also tensor networks in the fission. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and here you are testing the fidelity of the state, not of some observables, or in your experiments. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is a really hard measure, right? You are okay. checking fidelity, which guarantees that all observables will be good. The fidelity of the yeah. state, right. not of some of observables. The state. Of the state. Or Right. Yeah, this is the fidelity of the entire state. Yes, correct. All right. So that's so that's an open question. I I, I think it's going to be open for for a while. Hopefully not, but I think I think it might. Then, is there any usefulness application um, achievable before errors in our in the systems are so low that you just have logical qubits? You just implement QVC and you have logical qubits. And so emphasis on NISC. So. You know, people came up with this, uh, John Preskill came up with this term to coin the, the regime in which computers are not good enough to have fully logically, logical, error protected qubits, but they are large enough to, to carry some noisy computations that might be interesting. And so the answer might be yet, might be not, might be yes, might be not. Um, we, we don't know yet, we don't know yet. So there is progress on both sides, right? And uh, let's see who, who wins the race. What's that? Uh, that there is a thousand definitions okay. of using. <laughs> that's, that's, I think that's the key <laughs> of, the, of the question. I think one, one definition is that it, it is of interest. For somebody. Oh, I heard this <laughs> definition. It, it is interesting, 
when the paper is interesting without the word quantum in the title, when you already solved that problem, right? That, and you happen to solve it with quantum computers. Yeah. But who knows? Yeah, ask you know, different people. <laughs> uh, all right, I don't know how I'm doing with time. I, this was the first half, but I think this is a really a full time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to leave it here, um, you know, because there's a whole um, kind of worms in there. Um, when did I start? Which one did he start? It's <laughs> <laughs> 15 minutes after you end. Why is it important to start? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mean, I think we should, we should wrap up. Maybe you can just summarize yeah. the, the second part in about. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll course. try, I'll try. And then, I'll, I'll give the, really the, the, sum, the results. So, um, so, you know, you, we've been working very hard on, on implementing quantum error correction. And of course, I'm not going to go in detail through the, through the slides, but just talk through them. So, um, well, we are trying to implement the, the, probably the most popular uh, quantum error correcting code, which is something called a, a surface code, which lives on a two-grid, two-dimensional grid of, of qubits where you're performing several rounds of this protocol. And, and if you have low enough error rates, you're guaranteed that, you, that your logical qubit is not corrupted with, with very, very high probability. And so there is a, a crucial step in, in, in achieving this, uh, this realization, which is having access to a good decoder. So what is a decoder? A decoder is, is something that given an error graph, and you have to believe me that this is uh, an, an error model, you have to believe me that this is a, an error model, this is a specification of an understanding of errors in our device, uh, and measuring some observables on the system, it can figure out, uh, you can map this to a, to a classical problem, uh, to try to figure out uh, what happened in the system, did any error occur, and did your logical uh, qubit get corrupted. And so one possibility to do decoding is using tensor networks. And the problem usually in the literature for the last 10 years is that these approaches have focused on very specific error models, very textbook-like error models. And so for our experiments, we had to tailor this to, to very realistic error models, where you might have very, very weird errors, errors of high weight that affect you know, larger parts of your system that you expected, etc. And so such a flexible uh, decoder is what we built with tensor networks. There's a whole construction that at the end of the day looks like this. Let's see, looks like this. Given an error model, we can build a tensor network. There's a specification on how to do this with these four definitions of, of tensors, um, which after contracting, and in this case, you can do approximate contraction with compression, etc. It's a very, very natural place to do that. Uh, you don't need brute force contractions at all. Um, we went up to um, uh, distance five. So, you know, 25 qubits plus 24 data qubit to help you with your measurements, so 49 qubits. Why do you want a tensor network for that? So, uh, for different reasons. Any algorithm would be good, no? What, any algorithm would work? Any algorithm would be good, no? I mean, you have some classical control electronics. It gets the error syndromes. It produces the correction, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. well, why do you want it to, uh, to phrase it as a tensor network? Good. So the, you can map the problem of decoding, decoding optimally. So that's that's a key it's key word. Oh, I mean, I'm not sure what your function is. Uh, good. Good. Yes. Right. Yes. There is heuristics to decode quickly. Um, they are approximate. Uh, we wanted to know where the floor of our performance is, so get the best possible decoder, which has a definition is a maximum likelihood decoder, or you can call it optimal decoder. And when you try to to solve this problem optimally you can map it to computing a partition function of our some spin, spin model. Um, in the generic case, where I, I mentioned you, we have a very uh, varied zoo of, of errors, is not trivial how to build a, the spin model that you want to work with. Now we know how to do it. Um, and one way to compute this partition function is with tensor networks. You can try other approaches. This partition functions, so in the end, what, and partition functions often partition functions. We have, one can try many things. We found, we explored many routes, and, and for our purposes, this was uh, the most convenient one. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, all right, and so the, the question is, does this constru contraction, construction with uh, truncation, you know, with, with limited uh, computational resources, does it actually achieve decoding? Like, can you, what happens in reality when you run this over an experiment? And the uh, reality is that, yes, we had the first, uh, first experiment, and only as far as I know, that showed error suppression on the surface code. So the idea with error correction is that as you make these protocols or these codes larger and larger, errors get suppressed. Okay, and so if you make it very large, you have a logical qubit. You have a qubit that has, you know, error rate is 10 to the minus 12 or something like that, hopefully in the future. So to guarantee this suppression of errors, as you increase the distance, you need low enough error rates. You have to be under a threshold, and there's a whole theorem for that. That explains. What's the direction to the finger uh, left? That. There's a triangle okay. and a pentagon. What is what? what Here? Uh, well, what's the, the information on the is missing? What, what was, no, no, no. The, the, the big plot. What are the two symbols denoted? Is it like logical? Yes. Logical? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have. Yeah, so distance three, triangle, and ah. distance five, pentagon. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so if we use the, most, the more heuristic decoders, we are still not seeing suppression. What's the same system. Error? Physical error rate? Well, it depends on, on what error mechanism, but they, they are of the order of. Under, I guess you're saying we don't see suppression. When, when will I see suppression of this data? Well, if you have low enough error rates in your system, then implementing the surface code properly will give you an error suppression as you increase the distance. We just had access to two distances, distance three and distance five. And we'll, our goal at the end of the day is to see the pentagon under the triangle, to see a logical error per surface code cycle that is lower with the larger distance. Mm -hmm. And one way you can improve this is improving your hardware, right? Improving your error rates. Another way is improving your understanding of the error, your error models. And another way is improving your decoder. So that does it decode optimally or only approximately? In all cases, it's higher so, than your physical error rates still. Oh, and yeah, absolutely. Even in the absolutely. Memory, it's yes. Than yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea is that if you go to really large. So you see code, that if you increase the distance, at least it's getting better. Right? It's still worse right, than not right. using your correction. Yes, yes, yeah. You know, you, you have to scale these systems quite a bit. Uh, and so, Tensor Network, there is a pre-elaborate heuristic decoder that already gives um, slight error suppression, and Tensor Network achieve the, the optimal. This is, we know where, where this is at. We know the, that the rest of the improvement has to come from hardware and, and error modeling. Now, what is the, the problem? Uh, Tensor Network decoding is not fast, so it is not going to be used in the future in real time at all. This has to be post-processing, you have to run it on a big computer, etc. So what else can we use this for? Well, while we develop better fast decoders that might be approximate, we can use it as a benchmark to see how close they are to optimal. And that's what we did in, in our recent paper. You can read in the archive, but we, we have a new, a new, very interesting actually, uh, decoder based on, I'm just going to mention the word, ensembling different perturbations of the error model. And we can compare it to, to the optimal case, which is this lower uh, line here, which we run with tensor networks. And so you can see that as you increase the distance, the approximate decoder doesn't get as close to the optimal one, but it gets much better than the other heuristics that people use, which is the first line. Okay? So another thing that you can see is convergence of this, our tensor network decoder. As you increase the bond dimension, so this has units of one over the bond dimension. We went up to distance nine surface codes. Um, this is all numerics, it's not experiment. Um, you can see fairly fast convergence in practice with bond dimension, um, where the y-axis is the logical error rate. So how much error do you make when you run the entire, uh, what percentage of times are you not decoding properly when you run the full experiment? Is harmony the name of the decoder or something else? Yeah, it comes from harmonization or ensembling, which is, uh, I think, uh, a term in the literature. And, and so someone decided to call the decoder harmony. Yeah. Uh, OK, and you can think of, you can ask, what is the complexity of running this decoder? Well, for a fixed bond dimension chi, we have the following kind of tensor network. So I've erased uh, indices here in order not to make it messy. And what you see here are the tensors. 
and we have an MPS on the left. That's the, that's the primitive for our approximate um, contraction. And that MPS is evolving towards the right. And every time it sees uh, an MPO, it, it, it contracts with it, and then it splits again. Okay, and so um, you can see that if you arrange things properly, this is how this is very resembling. Uh, this resembles a local circuit, okay, where only a few sites on your MPS um, are are being affected by the MPO. And when you look at scalings asymptotically, uh, this depth, this effective depth, grows with distance of the code squared. The width grows with distance squared times the number of rounds. Sometimes, how long in time do you run this experiment? And then each split each um, decomposition of your tensors grows, as we all know, as one dimension to the third. So this is the final complexity. Uh, all right, so I'll leave here the papers that you might want to read on things I talked about, and there's a bunch of people involved in these works. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>